Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Alejandro Velasco. I'm a professor of history here at NYU. I teach um, courses on in politics and I, I'm from Venezuela and I work on Venezuela. Um, and so this event came uh, pretty spontaneously, so we're very grateful to Ahmad and um, the staff of Fox for putting it together, and in particular to Guillermo, for, um, who's only here for a couple of weeks, for, um, for allowing us to see some of the work that uh, they've been doing with um, Caracas and Comida, um, which is a sociocultural movement that works cooperatively with people uh, from working class neighborhoods from the you know, other municipality in Caracas which is one of the most violent countries in the world, in order to implement uh, violence prevention and reduction strategies inside of these communities. Um, Guillermo will be telling us about some of the research that they've been doing, but just briefly about him. He is a manager of Caracas Nicomide and the head of the research department at the um, psychology unit of the Universidad Católica Andres Bello um, in Caracas. He uh, has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a specialization in clinical community psychology in SUMA. Uh, from the University of Catalonia, and a master's in social uh, cultural psychology from the London School of Economics and Political Science. So please join me in welcoming. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if you know Caracas, or well, I know some of you know Caracas, but uh, Caracas is uh, the capital of Venezuela. It's uh, very dense, and more than a half of the population live in, in informal urban settlements. The, in, in Brazil, they call it favelas. In Venezuela, we call it barrios. And they occupy less than, sorry, they occupy less than 40% of, of the territory, and more than half people live there. Uh, this photograph, all of these, the photographs that I'm going to show are taken by our, our team. It's in a community called Piso Cien. The, the English translation is 100th floor. So you can imagine how far away it is. You have to literally take more than 100 steps to get there uh, through escalators. And we, uh, along with the community, identified, identified a hotspot that was a uh, basketball court. The, a criminal gang used to sell drugs in there and in, even they dropped bodies nearby. And here uh, is the inauguration of the public space recovery we did in, in Piso Cien. And right there behind the uh, kid in the white shorts. And it was after uh, a series of blackouts that happened in Venezuela early here. So that is like a, in one brief history what we do in Caracas we convive. We work along the community uh, in a cooperative way to recover public spaces and to reduce violence in communities that are very far away, that are very excluded and have high levels of violence. So, uh, before telling you uh, the data we have gathered, I want to give you like a current picture of the violence in Venezuela today. First of all, there is no official data. Uh, the government uh, has an information blackout regarding homicides and violent death in general. In 2016, there was a leak because the uh, Luis Ortega Díaz, the, the, was the uh, Fiscal General, General, Attorney General, Attorney General, sorry, uh, uh, sided with the position and leaked the, the day. But since then, there, has no, there hasn't been a official report. Uh, in Caracas Become Leader, there's a project called Monitor the Victimas that we gather the violent deaths that occur in Venezuela every day, journalists from uh, Rum Runes, that is a famous news portal in, in Venezuela, go twice a day to the uh, only one more in, in Caracas and interview the people with 32 questions uh, about the context of, of the victim and the people who commit the, the homicide. This is contrast with official information because official information only 
publishes violent deaths in two ways. One, homicides, when occurs between civilians, and the other one is resistance to authority. Uh, doesn't matter the context it happened, if a uh, police uh, or a national guard kills uh, a civilian, it's called resistance to authority. Even if it happened without resistance, or if it happened with resistance. The second uh, uh, point that I want to tell about the violence in, in Caracas is that the response from the official government has, government has been heavy-handed policies. In 2017, there was something called Operación Liberación del Pueblo, that in English is People's Liberation Operative, that came, that it began in La Cota 905, that is one of the most violent uh, barrios or, or favelas in Caracas, and they came early in the morning with people dressed in black and uh, with guns like this one, and uh, like confront criminal gangs or alleged to <coughs> confront criminal gangs. There was a public response against that kind of policies and they, they named it Operación de the Liberación del Pueblo Humanitaria. They added the humanitarian last name to make it more, more accessible, but it wasn't uh, very uh, well perceived among the population, so they eliminated and created FAES, that is a, the Fuerza de Acción Especial, is a, like the SWAT for the national uh, police, that is now responsible for 9 out of 10 deaths that is in hands of the security forces. And then, to make things worse, in Caracas, uh, the official government closed all the prisons that, that were in, in Caracas. And now, all of the people that go to jail in in Caracas, how to go to preventive uh, the prevention centers, right? And it's basically police dungeons, are spaces that are not designed to keep people inside of them. The law says that you have only you, your right is to stay only 48 hours before being a sentence inside those places, but people stay uh, for a really long time. There is a overfight of 400% and 90% of them hasn't received uh, a sentence. They have not been, been judged, judged. So that is the current picture in Caracas, where we work. And Caracas Mi Convías, as Alejandro told you, uh, we work closely, as we tell you, as, as, as you, I told you the story of Piso Cien, uh, to promote violence for strategy. So we have five initiatives that I'm not going to get deep about it, but I'm going to briefly explain to you. We work a uh, monitor the victims, carrying data, and make it accessible to the public. We do a public space recovery in, inside criminal hotspots in the favelas. We work with secondary victims of urban violence. We do social insertion programs for youth at risk, uh, and we generate uh, knowledge to research. So, uh, the overview of this talk, and then we can open to discussion. I want to show you the most recent data from Monitor de Victimas, and also I'm going to show you a, test, a qualitative testimony that I gather uh, along with a colleague in, from a mother who lost his son in the hands of the Operación Liberación del Pueblo, and then will be the, the discussion, okay? So, this is the data from the last semester of 2018. Uh, the blue columns are death where the civilians were responsible, and red, where the uh, security forces from official security forces were responsible. We can see that in most months, the security forces were uh, responsible for most deaths. But there is a lot of variance. The, there's not like a stability in the number of uh, extrajudicial killings or resistance to authority. But then, if you see, the data from the first semester of 2018, the data becomes systematic. 
there, there doesn't get any lower than 38%. And in months like in it, January and February, there was a lot, a lot of protests in Caracas, uh, social unrest, and they even make it to more than half of the money there. Then, another interesting data that we have gathered from Monitor de Victimas is the difference between the age groups that are victims. When civilians are the responsible for the death, mostly are young men from between 15 to 44 years old, where most of them are between 25 and 44 years old. When we take a look to the uh, when police forces are responsible, they, in average, kill younger people. Okay, they are, and younger people that tend to be more vulnerable. And when we take a look at the second semester of, uh, sorry, the first semester of 2019, it became becomes more more stable, more clear that their policy is to kill young, even younger people than the civilians, and from Rural communities. Okay? And another interesting data that we have in the Rural Monitor de Victimas is where the homicides happen. Again, the red columns are from police and National Guard, and the blue ones is when uh, civilians uh, are responsible. Most of the killings that happen inside the homes are if the police is responsible. It is difficult to assume that a um, resistance of occur on an on a exchange of uh, gunshots occur if it, the victim was inside the home. Criminal gangs don't uh, confront the police in their own homes where their family is. And another interesting data is that uh, the first column are killings that happen in Carabozo Polisar, in these uh, violence prevention centers there are, where police are custody, civilians are killing each other inside these so-called jails. That is in the second semester of 2018. When you take a look to the first semester, this becomes more clear, the killings inside their home, people's home, okay, of, of police. And the systematicity tells you that it's not a, a police who got out of law, but it's a policy that has become systematic uh, in, in Caracas and in Venezuela in general. So, uh, one of the things that in Caracas we continue, we realized that we were getting all of these Excel documents, and each cell was a person, and it was difficult to detached from that, so we decided to get qualitative testimonies of people that were registered in the Monitor de Victimas. So in 2018, we published a book called Cuando Suelo Negro, when the men in black come, because that, that was the way that the participant named uh, the policeman. As you, as you saw, one of the first uh, uh, pictures that, that I showed you, they come to the communities with wearing uh, black coats, and, and even they sometimes wear like skull uh, masks. And so I'm going to show you the story of Nancy. Nancy lived in a home uh, in invasion in Savannah Grande. Savannah Grande is a uh, is near Caracas downtown, and it has a lot of commercial uh, businesses. But Caracas is crazy and in a same street where you have commercial businesses, you also have the places where people have invaded and lived there. Nancy lived in one of those uh, apartments. So I'm going to show you a, a one of the, an extract for one of the interviews I made. Uh, I visited her uh, to her home along with a community leader of the live nearby and she let us, let us into her home and told us uh, uh, her story. So I'm going to read it to you. I let them in first and asked us if we were armed. 
they are talking about uh, the police. Okay? They grabbed my, my son and they took them out. And they were holding him face down in the hallway. They got upset and asked, what is wrong with you? And they answered, we are doing a proceeding. He was your ID. They said, they tell my son. He said to them that he didn't have, have it with him. He had it in his room and they asked me to look for it. They see the idea and said, your son killed a policeman on July 17 and he's under arrest. Please go to your room. When I heard that, I stood silent because you don't know what your children do when you're not around. The policeman kept telling me to go to my room and I said to him that I was not going anywhere. Then a man with a black hood came and he had a tube, the ones that are filled with cement on the inside. They took my son and dragged him to the second floor. The next thing I hear is a dry sound and my son screaming and I yell, you're going to kill my son and started to pray. Then I hear several gunshots and I swear to God, I said, Jesus, from now on, everything is under your control now. As she was telling us, she was like relieving the whole scene and then she uh, told us that she wanted to show us something. So we went to the second floor where his son was killed and showed us the, the wood marks uh, of, the, of the policeman. And she said that either she or, or her neighbors wanted to take them out because someday it will be justice. So the mark of the police violence uh, still was in Nancy's apartment. So to end uh, uh, my presentation and begin the discussion, everything is not uh, terrible back in Caracas, as I just showed you. Uh, we have a program, as I told you earlier, called Bamo Con Vida, that identifies uh, youth at risk. When we say youth at risk, is kids that are, are not criminals and have not engaged in violent acts or have other risk factors to do it. They have, for example, they are not working, they live in communities where there is a, a important presence of female gangs or police violence, their family is struggling, there is a lot of food insecurity in, in Caracas uh, right now. Not him, but another kid from his community told us that as a coping mechanism, he used to go out on the streets very early in the morning so her mom wouldn't cook for him. So the food was enough for her mom and, and his brothers. But uh, I chose United because he's uh, recently got a job in Los Costillas, that is a restaurant in the east of Caracas, that is like a upper middle class area. Uh, United is from La Cota 905, where the OLP started. When he came to our office, we asked him what he was going to do with her future, and he told us that nobody ever has asked him that, that he didn't know that. It was a very difficult question. That uh, when you, uh, the only thing was what was going to do next week. But he came, I remember, I arrived very early in the office, and we told him that we were getting a job for him and he arrived 30 minutes early to the meeting that we had. So we get him in Los Costillas, to, uh, to, they trusted us, and he's now working in, in there, he now wants to be a chef. So um, kids from La Cota 905 are the ones that do better in those jobs because they work overtime to not to be in La, in La Cota 905. In La Cota 905, let me put you uh, a picture, we have a, a community kitchen uh, uh, in there and 100 meters there is a control point of a criminal gang. Kids, no different for him, uh, uh, from him, have like the same guns that the uh, policemen have and they're always uh, constantly checking if the police are going to be up uh, to confront them because that's where the OLP started. So, even if, when there is a lot of violence in Caracas, if you give uh, the right kids the opportunity, we can, Caracas and I think is successfully, one by one, preventing violence in, in Caracas. But, well, that's the, like, the data I want to show you. 
Now the questions I have left, uh, um, the question that Alejandro already asked, but my question to, to you is, uh, we'll discuss the possible motives behind heavy-handed policies because the victims monitor, uh, monitor the victim and shown us that violence has migrated to, to police security forces rather than criminal gangs. And what are the motives behind them and the implications for Latin America? So uh, the, now we can discuss. <laughs> Comments or questions? I have a question actually. Um, why you mentioned in the beginning that the jails uh, were closed so that people went to these prevention centers? Why were jails closed? Uh, well, first, uh, under Chavez administration, there was a really iconic jail uh, uh, not far from the Sociedad, the community I showed you first. And he told that there wasn't going to be a repressive uh, a prison system anymore. Mm -hmm. It was like a political act. And then, uh, after Chavez, there was a uh, there was a really famous jail in the middle of one of the main highways in in Caracas. And there was a, a riot inside of that jail, so the federal government decided to close it. So the problem is that they haven't replaced any of them and they, they are uh, putting them in these police dungeons. So the, this has two major consequences. First, that those places are not designed for keeping people that much, that much time. So there, there are human rights violations. There has been uh, several videos that have uh, shown recently uh, social media of policemen torturing people that are, are in, in those centers. And the second, this exacerbates violence because policemen, instead of doing their job on the streets, they are taking, well, taking care, quote unquote, of, of people that are under those conditions. Okay, well, I have lots of questions. Um, but, so you mentioned that there is a general popular sentiment against the old events. My understanding is that, in general, that's true, but the picture is a little bit more complicated, such that, um, it, that it tends to be, at least from you know, public opinion polls and analysis and others, um, that public perception of the defies is very negative. But of the idea of a heavy-handed response to, to, to violence and to crime, it's actually more mixed. Um, which hues to region-wide patterns of broad-based sense that only a heavy-handed presence can mitigate the impact of criminal gang violence in, in popular centers. So can you tease that out a little bit more um, you know, the, the question of, because you, know, you, left it with the, you left the question on the table for us, right? How do we think about the impacts more generally? But, you know, places like El Salvador or, or Brazil to some extent, the discourse of Manaruda actually plays popular, which is a paradox. Okay. Well, I think there like, is a two level of understanding of that. First, there is an institutional level that there are no uh, electoral incentives for governments to do the kind of policies that are preventive and are uh, s smart. Uh, Dorothy Cronin, uh, that is a, an academic from Stanford University uh, uh, of Rome, that studies the case of Venezuela, uh, shows basically that there was no electoral turnouts in presidential elections when, when crime rise. During Chavez years, the crime rose uh, uh, to levels never has seen before and it kept winning, for example. But so, governments in general don't have uh, political incentives to tackle insecurity, to 
to a long-term policy. So heading out policies, when crime rises, is the easy answer to, to them. But also, I think that there is a degree of responsibility among society. Uh, we once were doing a focus group in El Valle, that is another uh, like iconic uh, working class community in Caracas, and we were asking them what are their proposals to tackle crime and violence. They first began saying most evidence-based violence prevention, uh, early education, if you have to identify young people and uh, give them opportunities. But then he started talking about a guy that lives nearby his home, that he was a, a criminal. So he told me, well, but that guy, I don't stand him. He always kept robbing my community. I wish someone comes and kills him. So there is a, a difficult uh, uh, like representation of what should policies uh, be in in this kind of communities, when there is a rational discourse, but when you when you live violence every day and you see that your kids are at risk of getting killed or you have a, a, a son that is between the ages that are the usual victim, it is difficult to to not yield to heavy-handed policies because this gives you a instant promise of security but the thing is that from our experience uh, with not only the data but our crisis with the community is when uh, the police uh, kills criminals and not criminals the, the, the tendency that they kill the most vulnerable not the well armed uh, is that co communities are fragmented people tend to stay inside their homes once uh, a teenage girl told me that she was a niña de su casa. In the middle class context, a niña de su casa is a girl that has good manners, that she behaves well. She was telling me she has literally a girl from her house that she didn't go on as a poor So that shows you uh, pretty well how the scar that leaves uh, this kind of policy inside the community. Yeah, um, well, I, I know Guillermo uh, and his work and the work from Colide. Uh, maybe if you uh, can tell us more about how's the pr procedure of the oil base when they grow up. Uh, because one of the things that I, I found more, more, most interesting is that how they break into the house. It's like how, this, um, how the door has become like it, it means nothing now. It's just it, it, it's like it isn't there because even people rather to leave the uh, door open when the uh, oil events are coming on. Um, that would be like uh, one question, and the second question is like uh, mostly for yourself and the people uh, that works with you in Combive. Um, I remember once that I went to Cota 905 with Combive. It was uh, 2017, and uh, oil the base started to come up uh, to the barrio, you know? and, and there was this guy, and he told me, like, uh, Miguel, you have to leave now, because men get killed, uh, and you fit, like, the stereotype of the men being killed. And I basically had to run uh, my way down from the barrio. Uh, it was pretty shocking. Um, and I've always wondered, like, how do you manage to deal with this kind of endangerment, uh, especially that seems like with the data it's been like systematically, systematically uh, growing. So how do you manage yourself and the people that work with you, like uh, in the neighborhoods uh, and in community as well? But uh, it's an interesting question because always people ask me that, uh, people from uh, middle class and upper middle class, <laughs> and yeah. asking me, why are you always in a lot? Are, aren't you scared? And the thing is that 
uh, one of our working principles is to trust the community knowledge as much as the technical and academic knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we always uh, are beside a community leader that works closely, closely with us. They, they are, I consider them my friends, I consider them exceptional people that are under harsh conditions, and when you are with them, they know the, if, it's, if it's dangerous or not. They tell us not to come a particular day, uh, we do, do not come. Uh, that is how we can get to La Cota 905, to, to Piso 100 even. Uh, I, before uh, I went there, I didn't know there was a place called Piso 100 in my own city. So, yeah, but it's the, the close work with community leaders. Uh, it's the backbone of our work. How, well, I'm curious how willing people were to talk to you about violence committed by security forces. I mean, I can imagine that's a very sensitive subject. So what, what was that process like and for, for people, what was that process like? Yeah, it, it depends uh, on the participant. For example, Nancy was very eager to talk right. because she has a, like a deep commitment on making, making justice on, mm -hmm. for his uh, son's name because the first thing that security forces do is to tag him as a criminal. So there is a lot of stigma even inside the community. Oh, what, was he a criminal or not? Even she tells me that she stood silent when the police forces told him that he killed a policeman because he doesn't know what her sons do when she's not around. So this eagerness to clean her son's name was her main motive to talk with us. Uh, in La Cota 905, we interviewed two families, and when one of the one of the first ones we, we interviewed was the sister of a gang, uh, of the leader of the gang of La Bota. Uh, they killed her son because of the relationship with, uh, with her brother, but he was not a cri criminal. He was not a brother, he was a criminal. So she wanted to make it clear that she, he was not a, a criminal. Even the, the president, uh, Maduro, uh, in, in a public uh, declaration said that uh, the OLP killed one of the gang leaders and was uh, this, this kid. So it's the motivation to clean uh, the person's name. The, and the name we have inside the community because we have a community kitchen there, we have you know, a public space recovery. So uh, one of the community leaders uh, uh, we did a inauguration of a basketball court, but it's not, it's not a classic basketball court, it was in, on, on the street. We only had one court, it was very improvised. But we recovered that space and we did a, 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 a graffiti with a graffiti artist there. And uh, there was like, a, the day we uh, opened that place, there was also a political uh, act of the from the opposition, and they were like seizing the moment uh, there. And the community leaders, uh, one of the community leaders realized that people were not uh, like pleased with being the act too political, because they were working all these months in performing a space, and some people like they were saying a uh, same political message in the space that they were in. She said to them that, well, but Convive is another kind of politics. It's uh, public policy, in Convive style. We do not talk, we do, uh, in this action, we have gained the trust of the people. Yes, yes okay, sorry. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak more to, because I know you mentioned it, um, like obviously right now and for the past few years, there's been a lot of increasing um, distrust in the police and like the KNB and everything. But then at the same time right now there's like that sort of shift in Latin America to like, okay, well in this, like because this government is like 
left, like the only solution is like to go like ultra right, like police force dictatorship kind of thing. Um, do you like how to reconcile the two? I guess because you know, like at the same time, you have people that are just like, well, listen, the police come into like my neighborhoods and like destroy things, but the solution could still be like other police destroying other things. Sort of how does it combine? I guess. Yes. Yes, it's a difficult issue, especially um, I am more worried how people from middle and upper middle classes think because they are the ones that at least suffer from this kind of policies. There has been some abuses from the spies in middle class neighborhoods, they, they grab kids and start harassing them, but it's not the same level of intensity. So. Uh, from Convive, through a monitor the victims, we publish uh, reports every month and we are trying to uh, analyze it for our academics in, in Venezuela. We are like making this an issue. Recently there was a, a, a report that used the uh, monitor the victims data and showed that uh, compared to Brazil that is, it is known for its police violence, we are like four times more lethal than Brazil in absolute terms, and we are much smaller than, than Brazil. So that kind of numbers that are, that are accessible to academia and to the public is a way to counteract in more specialized uh, spaces. But yes, we, we have that shadow, that uh, a government that claims to be of the people and has a very uh, left discourse having extreme right policies, so uh, uh, there is always the, the chance that people will, will uh, like support the kind of policies. We are trying not to. Yeah. I want just to add something. In Venezuela, it, it's very racist the way they, they are approaching the community. So every time the, the victim area is supposed to be a, a Afro-Venezuelan, Afro descendant, also from poor places, so every time that they have selected someone, it fits the profile that Mikael was saying. And also the other thing that I've seen, I've seen from the people from Riazin, on, on Observatorio de Sonado de Venezuela, it's Observatorio de Venezuela, it's that the, the rate of murders uh, has stopped, the, 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 the increasing of murders. But it has uh, uh, stopped increasing because they have killed the killers and in the same time they're killing the people around them so they're killing innocents and guilty and in, in this, at the same time and doing it in a very racist way and selecting people from those spaces with the, that characteristics that, that they have uh, selected yes sir you have like two statements right there, one is the racial, uh, in Monitor de Victimas, we ask the victim's race, and the majority of them, like 53%, are, they identify themselves either black or mixed, or mixed. What, what, what words do they use? Uh, moreno, or negro. Yeah. Moreno or negro. Uh -huh. <laughs> the sum of the two of them is more than 53% of, of the victims. And, but, uh, to be true, there's also a lot of data that people don't, don't identify either way, they don't identify with the race. So there is a question if uh, they are killing them because of their race, or they're thinking because people of that race live in, in those neighborhoods. Because uh, racism in Venezuela, it's not uh, very easy to make visible, but it's very, very deep. Uh, it is rare for uh, people dark skin to be upper middle class or middle class. So the racial profile of the policeman is is mixed with their socioeconomical condition. And the second statement that you told that more murders have, have, have reduced. There are like several explanations to that. First, there has been a lot of migration. Yeah. And 
uh, official reports still use the same amount of the population to calculate the rate of uh, homicides. There has been more, like four and a half million people have flew the country and are still using 30 million to calculate the rate of murders. And also, in Gondir, we did a research uh, comparing the official data from 2011 and 2016. In 2011, we used uh, uh, predictor variables that were from the national census. And in 2016, estimation made with uh, another, with ENCOVID, that is a national survey that, that came out that is like a substitute of, uh, or pretends to be a substitute of the national census. And one of the uh, most interesting uh, findings we, we found is that in 2011, the, if, the, if the municipality was uh, labeled as urban, it had like a significant predictor prediction power. And in 2016, that prediction power was reduced by half. So we had to do like a one by one observation, and we found that it's not that exactly violence has been reduced, but it has proliferated among different territories. So, and those territories is where informal economies uh, have uh, risen. For example, in, in Bolivar, where yeah. there is the, all the mining and gold, there they have uh, homicide rates about 400. It's so a yeah. Also, in the frontiers within Colombia, there is a lot of uh, gasoline, illegal contraband, homicide and pricing there. And also, uh, near Caracas, in Barlovento, there is a lot of uh, cacao, cocoa, and uh, they have been using it to launder money. So, violence and pricing right there. So, that violence has been reduced because of these policies. It's because it has migrated because of the economical harsh conditions. Also, when the Olympics started, they were somewhere like uh, 12,000 murders, homicides. And when you see one year after the Olympics, all the end, there were some losses of the authority and the homicides, there is a similar number. So, uh, uh, homicide, the perpetrators of homicide change for the intensity. Uh, In your opinion, the, the work that you're doing with Convive, do you, do you see this as something that could be applied in, in other places as well, or are there already some efforts to, I don't know, is there already some, some partnerships with with other organizations that are doing similar work, or? Okay. I'm, for example, I'm thinking in, in Nicaragua, a lot of the things you're describing, I would say, are also happening there, um, or are doing similar things, so I'm just curious. Can I just tag on to that question a little bit? Um, because it seems like this also speaks to the prior question over here um, to a similar extent. I mean, what you're doing sounds amazing. It also sounds exactly like what was being done 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, and while the one by one example makes a lot of sense, um, it seems like on the other hand, what you're describing with the numbers is a structural problem that is also a problem of Central American, South American, Caribbean networks of um, rule of law deficiencies, of corruption, of you know, cycle and cyclic crises, um, uh, migrations that then diffuse patterns of violence from one place to another, the so-called you know, balloon effect, you know, squeeze in on one end and it comes out the other end. So it, it's so I guess you know not to not to push you too much, but um, beyond the work that you're doing and the Comida does, what could you imagine as structural um, not necessarily solutions but steps right, that might, might actually substantially 
you move in a different direction. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Yeah. Want to answer yours first, which is more complex, and then <laughs> it's yours. Uh, yeah, that is a, a, a preoccupation we have uh, in, in Convir. But the thing is that what makes us different uh, from other organizations is that usually this kind of organization see a public service as something that is inherently corrupt. So I don't want to do anything with that. I'm going to, going to uh, criticize it in very smart ways, evidence based, but I'm going to, not going to get involved. I, our, I don't have political aspirations, but the founder of Caracami Pombia, that is called over Puerto Patino, is part of a political party and had, has interest in holding office eventually. So that's what makes different Caracami Pombia, that mm. works along with the communities, but knows the value of public service, even with his, with his mistakes and, and errors. But, mm. The response to not get involved in politics is, I think, what, what it has happened in, in Latin America from mm -hmm. the good people to not want to get the, into that mess. So in Caracas, uh, there is a, a kid, uh, well, it's not a kid, it's like six years younger than me. Uh, <laughs> he works uh, with us and he wants to be president one day. And he's, uh, from Catholic, and he's studying law, and he's doing community work, and he's uh, in a political party as well. So that's what makes us different in, in Colombia. Uh, we are betting to maybe not me, but maybe Roberto, Andrew, the, the, the kid from Cadia, holds office one day and and try to tackle the system. And Regarding your question, that same uh, question as part of the organization in Honduras that was from, I don't remember her name, where she was uh, a, a woman that was deputy of the Congress and there was uh, like an institutional uh, uh, crisis like in Venezuela and she asked us what we sh should we do to replicate our model back in Honduras and what I told them that the first thing that they have to do is to detect community leaders. That, uh, even well, what makes me the most working in Convina, knowing Caracas uh, deep uh, in their neighborhoods is even under the most, most excluded condition, the harshest condition, there is one or two or maybe five people that are exceptional and if you work with them and you give them the right resources, you can transform the communities. Mm -hmm. An imposing way of going to the communities. Well, I went to the London School of Economics uh, and Political Science. I know everything regarding poverty and violent reduction. That, that is the first mistake uh, a lot of organizations make. Instead of uh, trying to show off your degrees, listening to the community, detecting people, uh, to the communities it is uh, the most valuable task. And it's not easy because uh, there have, I have found some kind of resistance, not in my organization, but with all other people that will have studied for uh, five years. I went to college, I did all my exams, and this guy that has been there from high school knows more. Mm -hmm. In some ways, he, he does. And that is uh, like some of the work we in what can be. Well, one of our principles is, as I told you, community knowledge is as valuable as uh, technical knowledge. Uh, I think it would be interesting, uh, Guillermo. Um, Guillermo also works or is involved in Plan País. And, uh, I'm, 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 well, it's like, it's not like a plan for today, but it's kind of, well, in the meantime, uh, uh, all the political struggle uh, has some sort of uh, I don't know, relief or whatever. Um, a lot of people are thinking of these kind of questions like, okay, we've been like 30, 20, 40 years dealing with the same problems. Uh, what 
can, could, should, we do. And IEP was part of the uh, citizen security. So we have to do that. is also working with the people that has been working for a long time uh, in the same area as well. So maybe if, if you could talk about like what's the main discussion there or how's been the work there being. Yeah, it, it is interesting because uh, most of the experts, uh, there's a, some kind of diversity, but there are a lot of experts that come from former police uh, bodies in Venezuela. So uh, it has been a, a progressive work. They have, uh, they have understood watching all, all the mistakes that uh, this government has made through heavy-handed policies, that there has to be some other approximation to the problem, and we're now like doing a very intensive work on prevention, uh, violence prevention strategy. There is a lot of work, uh, as I told you, it's not easy to, to change the way uh, police officers make the their work from one day to another, but in Plan País, at least the police officers I've, officers I've talked to and worked with are very uh, conscious about the changes that have to be made. What changes exactly is what we are working on, but they, they have a mindset to change, you know, to reproduce what has been doing uh, currently. Actually, uh, I have a question regarding like um, political position because uh, you work. Um, I think like you have a lot of repression, like political repression in Venezuela. And I'd like to know um, the children that are educated or that are um, that you work with um, are like how are the families like? Do you have um, a lot of people that support Ch eh, Chavez, no, sorry, Maduro, and like, how how is how is this education like politically speaking? How do you address this um, political issue in Venezuela? Like, how do you explain for not necessarily like ch children, but like younger people, what's currently happening, like this political crisis? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, since it's beginning. When Convivio began back in 2013, the political scenario was not as it is today. Today, the majority of people are not uh, supporting Maduro. The time was like maybe half and half or something. And since its beginning, uh, Convivio uh, works with people of all political parties uh, because they live inside the, that community, so they have to face the same kind of problems. Uh, and that, that same spirit has been perpetuated now. We work with people that support and don't support Maduro. What we do now is when we talk to them, we discuss them the causes of the problems that they are having. Why, why does water is, have not run from seven years in my community, but electricity keeps running out? Uh, why I, I can't afford and it's not like a class of education, rather a discussion. And how has like how has the government actually like has did something? Has the government already said something? Because they are mostly like probably most against mostly against any kind of not education itself, but in a way that people yeah education because that's in a way. Well, they haven't like directly talked about us, mm -hmm. and we have been doing, I think, like smart work because we also have community kitchens mm -hmm. uh, uh, all over, uh, uh, not only Caracas but all over the country. So it is a like a smart resistance because it's very difficult to question an organization that is feeding kids. So, uh, also that, and 
we yeah we do community work like recovering a basketball court is not like uh, appearing in a TV show in Miami saying all kind of things about uh, Maduro. Uh, we do a different kind of resistance that is along with the people. So it is very difficult to to attack that. It's like you're attacking some organization that is helping the people that you are supposed to to be attending. Right. So. I think that is why they haven't uh, like tackled us. Maybe one more question. German. Yeah, I, I think it was perfect. <laughs> 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 um, well, wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, being here. Thank all of you. Thank you for inviting me.